mentioned, uh, my name is Gary. Thanks for having me here. Um, so a bit about myself first. Um, I'm a senior software engineer at Nintendo. And I've only been working with our mobile phone wheels in the last few years. I've been doing like Java because in my past life. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before that, before that. So just to like tell you like a bit of my background of things I've worked on and that's the reason why I chose the topic today. Um, so I work a bit more on the, the API side, uh, on the wells, and let's, uh, let's see what else. <laughs> the business intelligence tools, uh, something related to the financial reporting, which involves a lot of uh, SQL queries. And also uh, related to the data warehouse, which involves um, columnar database like uh, Amazon Question. And my favorite things about Ruby on Wells and why I'm still here today using Ruby on Wells is that um, it's really productive with Ruby. I like the syntax a lot. And Wells schema migration, I would say, is one of the, the best among other technologies. It's very controversial. I have tried like Node.js, Python, Django, and some uh, similar technologies, right? But I feel like they're not as mature and they're not production proven thing as what people have done with the Wells migration. And then they also come with uh, the, uh, well, the, uh, the querying interface for the database. And those are very nice. <laughs> so again, why, why the topic uh, database in this uh, Ruby user group meetup, right? As you all know, Ruby is started as the, the MVC model, right? the model field controller. And I would say the model layer is one of the most critical, especially when your prototype website started to have users, right? And you have that like hockey stick flow in your website. Most likely, the view and controller will be fine, but then I was I would, I would, I would, I would bet that you will have to rewrite a lot of the model layer. Most likely, because the first time you write the model layer, uh, you will work more like a very small data set. But as you get more and more users, like things have to change. The, the, your regular method is not going to work. Your site would be down like much sooner than you expected if you don't make those changes. And I would say if we did not do like some of the changes here, our previously our platform would be down like quite away. Like we will be gone by then. Um, so we start with like, something fairly simple, right? Um, like use patching. <coughs> don't use like not fine, okay? Um, this is something uh, you can start today. That you should always start today, right? A lot of other things maybe you can procrastinate and do it a bit later. And if you don't do the other stuff, you might be fine for like half a year or a year or two. Um, but this, you should do it like today. Um, five years, it means that instead of doing a, a SQL uh, select, um, so, so usually in the context is that you want to do, uh, you get a list of objects, right? And then you look through it. Um, during the loop, instead of calling the SQL select multiple times, you can just select 1,000 records from the database at once using one record. Okay. And the so like that, just that you can find out, uh, you get one group and then uh, you can get away from the groups. And it goes just like you get a bunch of IDs and then you can get all the objects um, right away. So definitely use that today. And then use mass search whenever possible. Um, if you were to insert records, let's say a thousand records into the database, it means you're uh, doing one thousand of SQL inserts. That's not necessary. You can use insert in um, you can insert one thousand objects in one SQL just by um, properly setting um, each value, align each value in an array. You can insert it like in one array in one SQL. Um, there are gems out there that can help you. So use that you would increase your performance by like, I would say like 1,000 levels. But I might be exaggerating but, um, but definitely do that, even today, even though you only have maybe a few hundred users, but tomorrow you're gonna have 10,000 users, so get ready for that. Um, then this one, will, uh, you might not need to use a lot of this here, but it would be great to really understand um, how logging works in. SQL and uh, in Ruby on Rails and how they do that. So there are two types of blocking. The first one is optimistic blocking. This is a case where you would assume that um, no one is going to have a lot of 
complex when you do in search or when you are modifying a web or modifying the data. And in the beginning, like I have a hard time like, trying to understand the difference between the two and when do, do I apply them. And it sounds pretty scary to like um, doing something, uh, not, not just using the standard um, Wells query interface and doing a bunch of like real, real options to uh, for those specific cases, right? Um, so for the longest time, no one really wanted to use either locking mechanism to to make sure that your data are inserted properly without any conflict or without the chance of having that lock during the inserts. Um, and it's easier than than you see it. Right? It's, it's supposed to. So it's very easy. You add a column to uh, to the the table. You just add one column, and then goes like magically um, do some sort of um, checking for you. So it's like a lock version on each whiteboard. So that if you have um, so you're using this example for, uh, here. So here you have like user one. They get an instance of user one from the database, and then you get another user, right? When you update the balance and hit save, the second user uh, information is still stale. It's like a stale whiteboard. Um, because it's, it's having the, the older version of the whiteboard from the database. And when you hit save, Wells is smart enough to fill the exception, uh, the stale object error. In which case, you will want to uh, rescue it and retry. Okay? Um, again, like, like the first time I looked into it, I don't understand why we have to do all this. Okay? Um, and then I found a pretty good an an analogy. Um, so imagine, I hope you all finish your dinner. Um, imagine you're at the washroom, right? So in the optimistic locking is the case where um, you open the door, okay? And then you will just pick, pick any uh, bathroom and then you just go in. And if there's someone inside, then obviously they will throw the exception and you have to get out and then we try again after. Okay? And pass some, uh, and the second uh, locking schema is a uh, pessimistic locking. It's where when you go to washroom, you lock the door. So if anyone else wanted to go into it, they obviously they cannot, right? Um, but as you can imagine, there will be a big issue when you have a lot of people trying to go to washroom. That means a lot of people will be blocked. And if that happens, a lot of requests will not be satisfied, and people won't be happy, right? Um, so, in that one, one specific case, we really um, had to update, let's say, a balance of. It's a very critical that we update the balance correctly, and that there's no uh, deadlock exception. Because when the deadlock uh, exception happens, or when someone cannot go to the bathroom, right, then they cannot update the balance, and that is. Uh, a big issue, and it's difficult to like go back and trace which user did not get the balance updated. Um, so you, so we, so the solution obviously at that time uh, was to use optimistic blocking, which is great when you have a lot of uh, reading, a lot of access to the database table. But then um, there's not too many whites. I mean, like most of the time, like the user in our cases, most of them they do not have to update the balance at, like every second but there will be a lot of access to the tables. So understand the two uh, mechanisms and apply depending on your situation. And no nested transactions, or no transactions in general. Um, in the previous example, you can, um, it will help if you just have a transaction block and you're making sure that when you update the balance and, you, and when you save the record, you will be wrapped in one transaction. Um, that's like, uh, not only you need to know that, but uh, imagine when you have a more complicated business logic, that means you have one controller with callbacks, and then you have uh, an associative uh, object model in, uh, in another uh, relation, right? Then in that case, very likely you would try to have one transaction here and then another transaction in the nested, or in the related objects. So. Sometimes you might not realize that you have a nested transactions. And somehow when, when, when people, people talk about nested transactions or not, and they would just imagine Wells will magically uh, make it work. But apparently that's not the case, because a lot of the database do not support true nested transactions. So far, I think only MS uh, SQL supports it. And if you just like, do this, right? Uh, do, like, look at this code here. You have an open transaction, and then uh, and that's the transaction here. 
let's say without this attribute, if you still uh, raise the mobile, let's say something happens here. Uh, oh, uh, by the way, we always use bank for the backend so that if some uh, if you cannot save the record properly, you will raise the transaction uh, exceptions so that your other transactions understand, so that you can properly uh, handle the error and then depending on the business logic, do whatever is needed. But so suppose uh, there's a bank here and then you somehow raise uh, some sort of uh, mobile bank, right? If without this one, what happens is that this one will still get created. Uh, both both users will get created, but you will imagine that the nested transaction would only roll back this um, the inner transaction. But that's not the case if you don't specify that. It's real why wells um, queue that by defaults. But uh, but, but just watch out for that. And then and again when you're doing uh, nested transactions. Um, watch out for the SQL queries that get generated, right? Know the plot of the begin and the commit. Know like, when they intersect and when, uh, when that happens because uh, you, you just want to know if a transaction gets saved properly or not. Um, so this one is uh, one, one big problem we have encountered and we will like, take taking some time to figure out why. So hopefully that will save you time if you see situations like this. Um, Use explain and check the test. Um, again, I think we always do this like, very often whenever you uh, have a query, especially um, when you're dealing with a lot of records. Because you might be thinking you are using the input index, but it's really hard to say unless uh, you do the explain and then you actually check the, go to the database, we use SQL code, right? and then you can uh, go in there get the, uh, the result and you will tell you like how many rows were scanned as part of this, right? If you scan more than necessary, then like try to, try to use another index and um, this one will take like a, a lot of, uh, I would say, trial and error and to, to, to really master this one. Um, and the next one, use multiple database servers. Um, first of all, you shouldn't have a single point of failure, for, especially for your database. <laughs> um, if, like, I guess you can always do backup and restore, right? But there's another good reason to use multiple database. Um, when you have like so much traffic into your database server, right? A lot of things can go wrong. And with a web verification, not only does it um, take the load off, but it reduces the risk. And um, you. And there's like a few other reasons. So for first, um, using master for writes means that only the, the master could do all the writes and then you can use another database just for read access. And a lot of business analysts would might want to have access to the, um, the database to do some sort of calculation of queries for, um, for whatever they need. So in this case, like you don't want them to touch the main database. Um, like you know, obviously you might want to have like a, non-operational database for that reason. But, um, but either way, just, not, just don't use one um, master database for read and write and everything else. Um, and Wells have a very easy way that allows you to do that. Right? There's an octopus jam, uh, the DB charmer. Uh, sometimes you might have to specific uh, which database to use for that specific query. Or sometimes they can be automatic. Um, it's very straightforward, you can specify the environment that can allow you to do all this. And, and when we talk about um, database access, um, so some, something you can um, usually you want the results and the responses right away, right? Those are you need the, the, uh, the database for that. But sometimes, let's say you're running a, a report or when you are, let's say, creating a file, uh, exporting some sort of data from the database, you don't need access right away. You don't need the response time to be quick. But then, most likely, you are processing a lot of data at one point. Um, and you don't want to use operational database for that. Uh, first of all, they're not optimized for that reason, right? Um, they are like uh, role-based. Um, what people usually do is uh, they would export the data into a, a columnar database. And the columnar database is great because it's like a transpose of the uh, the, 
the role-oriented role database in the sense that it allows you to have a like, really good compression of the data. Uh, the whole point, again, is for faster aggregation. So let's say you want to get um, the summation of the last 10 years, right? Um, you can, the performance is usually like a lot, way, a few magnitude better than any operational database you can, you can uh, use. Um, so the use case is for like business analysts, right? In the company, when you people want to understand the business logic or the business side of the things, right? Um, you don't want them to want a very long query that would block everyone else because the, the number of database connections is limited. So you don't want those like business analysts blocking your day-to-day -day operational database. Um, and then also like they don't want to wait like, three hours to run um, an aggregation just um, for, like, for every things that they want to ask about. So there are like a number of options out there. Um, I think many people will use like MongoDB, Elasticsearch. Um, that's, that's not fine, but just, just be careful that um, when you do that, that means you enforce a lot of the, the ETL process, uh, which means the, I think the extract transform low process, which is taking a, a bunch of data and then putting it in another data store. Um, but Autopus and DB Charmer and with all those can also allow you to access to those database. Um, and one, even one accessing query um, in, that, in, the, uh, in those database store. And the next is um, the age of Westview and all kind of, uh, of offline processing server. This is, uh, I would say, one of the, the things that gives us the most headache. Um, so you have a uh, the web server running that is processing all these uh, transactions and we we pass, right? And then you have this like offline that is also processing a, a lot of data, and then they all share a connection, a, a pool of connections to the MySQL database, and then that means, and usually you might be limited to two hundred. I think by default, maybe one hundred to three hundred connections for one single database node. Um, if you have a lot, like 100,000 users, at one point in every second, most likely you have a few hundred people trying to access it, then you will run out of connections uh, to the database and, and you don't want any particular connections to fall away, as I mentioned earlier. And delay jobs are usually the, the server that has to work on the jobs that takes a long time. Right? So you have to figure out how to like, allocate it properly. Like, um, so for things that we want to run on uh, delay jobs, right, will be like sending emails, right? It can be fast, it can be slow, right? Um, or it can be like running reports. Again, you can take like, an hour or two for each one to finish. Um, and you can be maybe like, exporting uh, a CSV file, and, like those stuff. Or you can be like a day-to-day, a, -day, a daily job that has to run for a few hours. So, so, so all this, again, picks up uh, the database resources. And within each of the jobs, there might be um, transactions or nested transactions and callback that you have to deal with. Uh, meaning the order of the operations might, might matter uh, as well. So, so when I say like beware, what, what can you exactly do? Um, Few things uh, you just have to al uh, allocate the resources, the, the, the meaning the, the workers properly. Um, and if that lot do happen, you might like I mean errors do usually happen no matter what. Uh, even though you have a lot of workers, in maybe ten thousand requests you might end up with one or two. My SQL workers have like those weird things um, that might throw you in that log exceptions uh, once in a while, and you need to prepare for that. Uh, for mission critical task, you don't want to miss even one request, right? You need to find out what the issue is. Um, in that case, like, retry. Um, so by retrying, it means that your task needs to be able to run multiple times. Like for example, you don't want to increment the balance like five times, and then the increase, like, the, and then balance keep like incrementing or something like that, right? You need to, like within each of the job, it needs to be like kind of self-contained that even in the case of um, retry, you can, uh, it will be fine. Um, yeah, the, I mean, 
you might also want to look into uh, different issues, uh, different uh, properties of the, this one. Right? I think the popular one now is psychic, but um, just be aware of all these transactions. I mean, the, the underlying DV is about the same for all of this, right? It's about how you scale, how you structure your code within a transaction such that um, it's not going to impact, like all of the, the tasks will be run properly independently. Um, and this one, uh, do not use DB migrate. That's like I mentioned earlier, it's one of my favorite features, so why don't we want to use it? Um, <laughs> this one, it, uh, it's just a very simple thing here. Uh, when, when your database gets over a few million records, it just, um, just try yourself, it will take more than like 10 minutes, right, to, to run the uh, DB migrate. And it's surprising that by default they don't do something about that. Um, there are like a bunch of gems out there that allows you to do a massive search, but definitely use one of those. But the, the basic idea is that instead of having um, the DB migrate that would like, because, okay, what DB migrate, let's say you want to add um, a column to your database, right? What you do is you do a uh, alter table and that's going to block the table. And when you block the table, it means that whenever you have new transactions coming in, like, they, they won't be able to satisfy. Like, again, they cannot go to the, the bathroom, then they won't be happy. So, um, so by what, 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 what most of the gems do is they will create a new table, move the, move the data over, have a trigger that uh, copy the data to the new one and the old one, so that once it's done, you can swap the table at the end all in one transaction without affecting any other transactions. Um, similar thing when you want to like remove a, a table or some columns from a database, you need to yeah, use another gem, don't use DB migrate. Okay, and that's it. Um, I went through the slides pretty quickly just so that um, I have more time <laughs> for questions in case we have uh, yes. Um, I would say look at the graph for your database. So we look almost every day, like we always stare at the, the database graph. If anything happens, like if you see a spike, we try to figure out the reason why. It's, uh, we try to almost do all the optimization based on the database graph. So uh, we were using Whitescale, uh, which shows you, um, I think any, any uh, like Amazon or whatever, you can do the same thing, right? You can see the wheat graph, the bytes, and if, if, you, if your application is quite heavy, then um, you might need to know like, which query is doing a bunch of writes, right? Then you want to do like massive search to reduce the number of writes. If you, you see that it's weak heavy, then use a caching system to uh, catch up the, the reads that you have. And you can use, and in that case, you want to like, take it out to a uh, slave database. So you just, like, ideally, we want to keep the main database. Uh, the truck, the, the load to be as low as possible. You almost have like, no goal. That, that's the ideal situation. Yeah. yeah, again, so most of this I like, might not need to do initially. It's only the first, uh, the first slide where I think you should do like today. 